Hello, how are you today? I'm uh, Benjamin Mio uh, from ACMC um, Cardiology Department. So it must be February. We're wearing red. You march the cardiology person out over here. Every February, American Heart uh, Month affords the cardiology community the opportunity on how we promote cardiovascular health and educate the public and our patients. I'm grateful to Premier Fitness to be awarded this opportunity. Many of you will be surprised on how far we've come, but how far we have yet to go. Heart disease comes in many flavors, and I'll try to hit on a few today. Des despite many campaigns, it still remains our leading cause of death in the United States. Alarmingly, it is rapidly affecting a younger female population. Notably, the incidence of heart failure is increasing in women, especially among racial and ethnic minorities. So a little question for you. What is the most common presentation or symptom of a person having a heart attack? Is it chest pain, shortness of breath, left arm pain, or jaw pain? So, that's what I said. But unfortunately, the most common presentation still remains sudden cardiac death. You know a person has a, had a heart attack because he just died from it. <laughs> While mortality from a first heart attack has dropped dramatically, thanks to improvements in basic cardiac life support, and many interventions such as heart catheterizations, they still remain fatal at least one third of the time. How many people here know CPR? Excellent. Very good. So what causes a heart attack? 99% of heart attacks occur due to a ruptured atherosclerotic plaque. Most people think that a heart attack occurs because their pipes get more narrow and narrow and narrow. A pathologist by the name of uh, Michael Davies in the late 70s and early 80s did over 100,000 autopsies on people who have just had a heart attack. And believe it or not, it was due to plaque rupture. And most of these people only had 40% blockages. Ar uh, arteries of people with atherosclerosis form rings when the plaque ruptures. On average, most people have seven rings, sort of like the rings of a tree. On average, the degree of narrowing on these people having heart attacks is only between 30 and 40 percent. This is why we need to rethink how we treat atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a lifetime disease. This is why your neighbor had a normal stress test a couple weeks ago, but died of a heart attack last week. This is a book that I often use to illustrate atherosclerosis to my patients. It's a book by a gentleman by the name of Herbert Starry. Herbert Starry is a pathologist. So the, this represents an artery of a person with a 90% occlusion. And if you look really closely, you can see the rings of atherosclerosis. The one in the middle represents a lesion of 50% occlusion. And again, you can notice the rings that have formed. This gentleman wasn't so lucky. He had a, a plaque rupture and his artery was only 40%. So what is it about plaque that causes a, a heart attack? Cholesterol moves freely inside the artery. What happens though when, this, when the cholesterol becomes inflamed it becomes oxidized. And as it becomes oxidized, it attracts more cholesterol particles, thus forming a plaque. Think about a, a pimple inside of your uh, artery. 
The thing that causes the heart attack are, micro, are called microphages, or, or macrophages. Macrophages are, are uh, white blood cells that contain a protein called tissue factor. Tis a tissue factor is a wound healing signal. When we cut ourselves, we, we stimulate the production of tissue factor. It's that tissue factor that causes that clot. The difference between cutting ourselves on the skin and cutting and having a, a, a ruptured artery is that there's less real estate in the coronary artery. So when tissue factor mat, uh, mixes with the blood, it forms like an epoxy, you form a clot. And it's that clot that causes that dam, and then you, don't, you have a uh, downstream, you have lack of blood flow causing the, uh, the actual heart attack. So what are some of the risk factors for de developing atherosclerosis? Believe it or not, the number one risk factor for developing a heart attack is your age. The older you are, the more likely you are to have a heart attack or a stroke. And as I often tell my patients, look, I can't prevent you from having a heart attack in your lifetime. What I do hope to do is trying to kick that can as far down the road as possible. This, the second leading risk factor for atherosclerosis is genetics. Unfortunately, we were born with these set of genes. Our genes determine our cholesterol, the size of our coronary arteries, and our risk, fact, uh, and the, and our risk for developing uh, premature coronary artery disease. Smoking, as we know, is a major risk factor for not only developing heart attacks and strokes, but also cancers. The way that you look at smoking, smoking is a, a drug irritant to the lining of, of your vessels. And I just told you that the more inflammation that you have, the more likely are you are going to develop plaque. The way that you think about high blood pressure is high blood pressure is a mechanical irritant to the lining of your vessels. And we know that the higher your blood pressure, we know people that have blood pressures of 160, 170 are, are more likely to have a heart attack versus those people that have normal blood pressures in the 120 and 130s. Diabetes also acts as an inflammation and, and, and so does an insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome. Sorry, I forgot to click. Lipids. Uh, the, higher, the higher your cholesterol is, the more likely you are to have heart attacks or strokes. And again, it's just area underneath the curve. And then lastly, inflammatory uh, disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and IBS, and, and those type of inflammatory syndromes. Atherosclerotic heart disease is a leading cause of death. Atherosclerotic heart disease caused 18.5 million deaths last year worldwide. That is 2,300 deaths in the United States every single day due to heart attacks. Cancer is estimated at 10 million worldwide. Atherosclerotic heart disease is twice as likely to kill you. So a disturbing trend going on, especially in the United States, am I going backwards? Sorry. I'm sorry, John. So the slides just shade this uh, disturbing trend. <coughs> the first statin, Lovastatin or Mevacor, was approved in 1987. Along this time, <coughs> We reduced the incidence of smoking. We got smoking down in the United States from 40% down to uh, 14%. And then we, became, uh, we, we had a, a campaign where we got much more aggressive in people's blood pressure. With these efforts, there was a, a significant decline in, in cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, there's been a frank upward trend in cardiovascular mortality in both men and women due to the epidemic of obesity, 
diabetes, and cardiometabolic diseases. This graph represents the death rate in women from cancer and heart disease in, in the age group between 45 and 60. This population of women represents the fastest growth of cardiovascular death in the United States. At this rate of growth, and left unchecked, heart disease will overtake cancer as the leading cause of death in younger women. Studies have shown women are much more fearful of breast cancer than they are of atherosclerotic heart disease. Even though the mortality rate from heart disease is somewhere between six, six to eight times greater than breast cancer, women on average develop cardiovascular disease about 10 years later than men. For the most part, there's misconceptions that lead to undertreatment of women, especially those with a disease called familiar hypercholesterolemia. Familiar hypercholesterolemia affects in one in 250 individuals. It is an autosomal dominant disease, which means it affects men and women equally. Women with FH generally have 20 to 30 years earlier onset of atherosclerotic heart disease. Women with FH do not have premenopausal advantages and have the same onset of cardiovascular disease that men do. 30% of women with untreated FH will have their first heart attack before the age of 60. 50% of men will have their first cardiac event before the age of 65. 33% of women will have their first cardiac event before the age of 65. I believe managing cardiovascular risk are, are based on an overly short time horizon. Compared to the timeline of the disease, we need to be addressing the risks and treating risk factors much earlier in life. Everything you need to know about treating lipid lowering you learn in high school. Remember high school calculus class, area under the curve in the integer? The enormous driver of atherosclerosis is indeed exposure underneath the curve. What's imperative for people to know that mild to moderate elevations in blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol for a sufficient number of years does increase the risk of atherosclerotic heart disease to an earlier onset compared to individuals with normal blood pressure, blood sugars, and lipids. Unique risk factors for atherosclerotic heart disease in women. Menarche, whether early or late. Polycystic ovarian syndrome, a 20 to, or, I'm sorry, a 30 to 50% increased risk of developing atherosclerotic heart disease spontaneous pregnancy loss, preeclampsia, lack of breastfeeding, early menopause, which is also a risk factor for developing early Alzheimer's disease, chronic inflammatory symptoms such as RA, lupus, which are much more prevalent in women. Cardiovascular disease differences in women. Women are more likely to have ischemic with non-obstructive coronary disease than due to microvascular disease. And I'll explain microvascular disease in one of the next slides. Women are more likely to have something called SCAD or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. I'll explain that also. And women are much more likely to have stress cardiomyopathies uh, known as broken heart syndrome or more technically known as Takasubu's cardiomyopathy. So this is the vasculature of the heart. The arteries of the heart sit actually on the surface of the heart. And the arteries go from, uh, to the, from the surface uh, intramuscularly. So you have all these small uh, arterioles penetrating the muscle of the heart. Women are, as I pointed out, are much more prone to have microvascular disease. Some reason, some people feel just because they have smaller coronary arteries, um, but some of the com common causes are just like 
anything else is smoking, inflammatory syndromes, uh, ra uh, women are more prone to develop Raynaud's, uh, diabetes, and metabolic syndromes. And these latter ones are the ones that actually cause abnormal thickening without disease. When to suspect someone would have microvascular disease? You can do, you can do a sophisticated uh, PET scan, um, but it's common in smokers to develop microvascular diseases before diseases of their large vessels. So one of the canaries in the coal mine for a man to, to suspect that they has coronary artery disease is erectile dysfunction. Uh, your, your eye doctor is going to know whether you have uh, vascular disease before you do because he's going to look into your retina and look at, the uh, look at your microvascular that way. So what is a spontaneous coronary artery dissection? So your arteries, the way that th you think of your arteries have layers sort of like a piece of plywood. And so when you leave that piece of plywood out in the rain, that those, those layers will separate. And that's what a dissection is. And so you can have like a small flap um, and maybe have like a little bit of chest pain or the flap maybe get a little bit larger um, or the flap can actually get so large that it can cause occlusion. The other problem with a dissection is as it separates, a certain amount of blood can actually cross into the false limb actually causing the person to have a heart attack. Some common attributes of women that have um, uh, SCAD are, we see this every once in a while with, uh, during childbirth or women with uncontrolled high blood pressure a condition called FMD, or another rare condition called Ehlers-Danos uh, Syndrome. Data from the Palm Registry. The data from the looked at women and statin use. Women in general are less likely to be offered a statin than a, than a man would. Women are more likely to decline statin use or discontinue the use of statins without talking to their doctor. Women are 30 to 50 percent more likely to develop myalgia, so that cramping people get from, from statins. In secondary prevention, where statins have shown a significant benefit, women are, are less likely to be on their statin two months after suffering a heart attack. This is something that we have to deal with in cardiology just about every day. So the, the Samson study, uh, looked at comparing um, people taking statins versus people taking placebos. And believe it or not, 90% of the people that develop myalgias on the statin also develop with placebo use. Now, whether you develop myalgias on placebos or statins, the, my, the myalgias are, 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 are true, and we have, we have to deal with that. So, if you don't leave here with, with, without one thing, I, I do want you to remember this, okay? So people still look at total cholesterol, and I wanted to quote one of the famous lipidologists in the United States by the name of Ron Cross. So Ron said, total cholesterol has just about a, the same significance as your eye color for the development of atherosclerosis. So what when we manage cholesterol in cardiology, we, we look at either ApoB or your LDL cholesterol. And that's where your eyes should go when you, get your, when you get those results back from your physician. Don't look at your total cholesterol. Look at, look at your LDL cholesterol, or if your primary care doctor does ApoB, look at your ApoB. Those are the significant numbers. Those are the numbers that we treat. So some options for lipid lowering. So the first thing that usually comes out of our, part, uh, up, uh, out of our pocket, if somebody has abnormally high uh, cholesterol, we uh, typically pull out the statins. And the reason being they're the cheapest, they're the most researched. But unfortunately, statins work on every single cell of the body. And so they come with certain side effects. 
So they actually have, uh, out of all the cholesterol drugs, probably the most amount of side effects, other than niacin, and we don't use niacin anymore. The, the second choice is usually a drug called acetamide. Uh, acetamide, also known as Zetia. Um, so how this drug works is, so again, uh, cholesterol goes out and it uh, does its thing from the liver. Once, once the cholesterol is recirculated, it comes back to the, to the liver. What azetamide does is blocks that reabsorption, so you just end up uh, pooping the cholesterol out. Very few side effects, very well tolerated, very, uh, it shows a significant uh, benefit in lowering your stroke and heart attack risk. The next group of drugs are called PSK9 inhibitors. They go by the name of either Repatha or Preulent. These drugs, uh, these drugs uh, were developed by a woman, and I, I apologize, I, I don't remember her name, uh, approximately about 15 years ago. And there's a group of people out there that have PSK9 gene, and these people have at really high cholesterols, and they're usually dead by the age of 30 of, of cardiovascular disease. But then she also discovered uh, a group of people that have inhibition of this gene. And these people actually w walk around with ab abnormally low LDL cholesterol. So we uh, term LDL. And these people have LDL cholesterols like in the teens. They live completely normal lives, completely normal development, okay? And have very few uh, strokes and heart attacks. So this, these are really the drugs of choice when we have somebody that has familiar hypercholesterolemia, or younger people that we want to, to stabilize their plaque or try to get plaque regression. The next, next group of drug is a drug called benpodelic acid. Uh, it's not very well known. It's been out for about five years not right now. The insurance companies don't really approve it very much. We get like an 18% reduction on using benpodelic acid alone. Benpodelic acid works in the same uh, pathway as sta statins do, but unlike statins, they're pro-drugs. And so the, this drug, unlike statins, only work in the liver. Um, and so there are very, very few side effects with benpodelic acid. The biggest side effect for benpodelic acid is probably the cost. So benpodelic acid, um, to get a real big bang for your buck is usually com combined with azetamide. And with that, we usually get a 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol. The new kit on the block is a drug called enclycerin, or Lefkio, you see being advertised now. So the, uh, this drug works on that same PSK9 site. It inhibits uh, the protein there. So this drug is sort of interesting in the fact that we give it once, you give it again in three months, and then after that, you only give it every six months. Um, so we, we just started, this is a new drug for us. We started uh, giving this probably last month. Uh, we opened up a, uh, a clustering clinic. It's uh, led uh, by our super nurse, uh, Lucia. And if you think that you're a candidate for that, you can always give Lucia a call. So strategies for lipid lowering. St strategies for lipid lowering need to be individualized for, for, the, uh, for the patient, uh, for the cost, and, wh and what you're trying to achieve. So every patient has different targets. Some goals of therapy. Again, we target LDL cholesterol. Goals of therapy for high-risk individuals, so those people that have had strokes and heart attacks, people with diabetes, we're looking to drive down their cholesterol, uh, their LDL cholesterol less than 55. Moderate risk individuals, we're looking at a target of less than 75. And then for low risk individuals, uh, uh, less than 100. And to quote uh, my office mate, uh, Dr. Barry, the lower the better. Dr. Barry uh, has been with us now for about a year and a half. He's our director of uh, of the cardiac services laboratory. So he's the director of, of, of cardiac rehabilitation, the echo lab, and the stress lab. He's been a great addition to our team. 
the roles of diet and lifestyle and cholesterol. There are there are uh, there are uh, some benefits of diet and, and and lifestyle, but for the most part, cholesterol in our blood is predominantly genetically predetermined. Approximately ninety percent of the cholesterol that we have circulating is made by our liver. We can manipulate cholesterol by limiting saturated fat for about, uh, and everybody's a little bit different, but typically by, by limiting uh, saturated fat, you can get somewhere between a 10 to 20% reduction. Dietary cholesterol, on the other hand, the, cho the cholesterol that we eat, like from eggs or some, from shellfish, very little, of the, very little of that actually gets absorbed. Dietary fiber has a role in cholesterol uh, reduction. So when we eat high fiber foods, uh, they bind with bilirubin. So uh, cholesterol uh, is, we need cholesterol to produce bilirubin. So the more fiber that we eat, the more bilirubin that we pull out of circulation. So the more bilirubin that we pour out of circulation, the more cholesterol we're gonna pull out of circulation as well. Exercise can help lower triglycerides and, and raise uh, HDL. It has little, bit of, has little uh, effect on LDL cholesterol. So how do we de define coronary artery disease? So chest pain, elephant sitting on my chest, radiation to my arm or neck, associated with nausea or vomiting, EKG changes, shortness of breath, reduction in ability to do work or functional capacity, or presence of biomarkers in our blood. The electrocardiogram, every time the heart beats, there's a signature that can be measured electronically. And we call this the electrocardiogram. The first beep is the, what we call the P wave. And that is the, that is the the top uh, section of your heart, you have two top sections and two bottom sections. The two top sections are called the atrium, and the P wave is the, the atrium contracting. The next large wave is called the QRS complex, and that's the bottom uh, of your heart, the ventricle uh, firing, and then the T wave, and that is the ventricle resetting or repolarizing itself. So this, this slide came from a, a Friday afternoon conversation with Dr. Flesher. So Dr. Flesher and I, we, we pretty much started about the same time, about 40 years ago. Believe it or not, 40 years ago, the treatment of a heart attack was pretty simple. We just threw him in bed. After that became, uh, became the introduction of beta blockers. Beta blockers, some, some people would know them as like carvedilol, metropolol, indorol, those kind of things that end in all. And what they are, uh, what beta blockers do is they act as governors for your heart. What they do is they slow the heart rate down. So every time your heart beats, it represents a generation of work. So the more that I slow it down, the less the heart needs to work. The other a thing that's very unique about the heart. So all your organs in your body uh, get blood during the pulse, the systole. The heart, on the other hand, fills with blood during rest, or what we call diastole. And it fills with blood uh, by the arteries vasodilating. So the slower that we, we, the, the slower that we get the heart down, the less work that it has to do and the more time that it has to fill. The next thing that came around was, was aspirin. And then um, we started using, once we discovered that uh, the heart attacks were caused by, by plaque rupture, we wanted to get rid of that plaque as soon as possible. So we developed these clot busting drugs. And the first was called streptokinase. The problem with streptokinase it was, was too good. And not only did we dissolve the clot, but we ended up having a lot of bleeding problems. After that came the onset of balloon angioplasty. And balloon angioplasty was successful 50% of the time, 
<coughs> the other 50% of the time was there was nothing there to keep that thing open and so it occluded and it became a surgical emergency. So we had to whisk those people off to surgery. And then we are where we are today with the, with the advent of the stents. Um, so Dr. Flesher is our medical director. Dr. Flesher uh, also does uh, pacemakers here. Uh, I credit uh, Dr. Flesher for my transition from cardiac service to my, uh, from cardiac surgery to where I am right now in the, the cardiology department. He's been a, a very big help, a very big part of what I'm doing today. So how the nomenclature has, has changed in defining a heart attack. So back in the 1980s, when we looked at the EKG, we defined having a heart attack as a, either a Q wave or a non-Q wave. So the problem with defining the non-Q wave versus Q wave is it often took three to five days for the Q wave to develop. The Q wave developed in conjunction with the heart dying or the formation of a scar. Nowadays, and this is driven by the advent of interventional cardiology, we look more at the ST segment. In the acute setting, there's a defining feature that predicts loss of blood flow to the area of the heart, and this is called ST segment elevation. Sometimes we call this tombst uh, tombstones. The ST segment is a flat line that connects the end of the S wave to the beginning of the T wave. If the ST segment becomes elevated in more than one lead, this signals blockages to the artery, and we call this a STEMI. And so this is, this is, a, this is an emergency. This will get you on a helicopter. If you show up in the, in the emergency room with the STEMI, the goal is to get you to a cath lab that can open up that artery as soon as possible. We call this our door to balloon time. Our door to balloon time at ACMC is, is less than an hour, and that's very good. The quote, time is myocardium, is a term coined by a, a famous cardiologist by the name of Eugene Brainwald, Brownwald. I'm sorry. He was a director of the Timmy Group. And what it means is the longer the heart is, deprived of oxygen, the less chance that heart's going to recuperate. So the sooner that we get you on the, the helicopter and get you off to the clinic, the, the better off everybody is. So what is, a, what is a cardiac catheterization? So the heart catheterization became uh, refined at the Cleveland Clinic by a gentleman by the name of Mason Soans. And the, heart, the first heart catheterizations was was, called, was done by a procedure called the Sones Technique. And the Sones Technique was a, a cut down of your brachial artery. And so it was like a little mini surgery. We exposed the brachial artery and then stuck the catheter up. After that, we started doing it more through the femoral approach in, in your groin. The femoral artery is about the size of your pinky. And nowadays, the predominant form of heart catheterization is done through your radial artery. So you go in, they uh, canalize the radial artery by something called the Selinger technique. They advance the catheter up through your arm, down to the uh, arch of the aorta, and then back down to the base of the heart. At the base of the heart, you have two coronary osteum. You have a right coronary osteum and a left coronary osteum. We engage the, the osteum with a catheter uh, trickle down a little bit of uh, dye, uh, uh, IV contrast, and we follow that dye down. If there's an occlusion, then there's going to be a blockage that, that dye's not going to fall down. The catheter also has a one-way valve that al allows us to put uh, things through it. One of the things that we put through it are stents. And so these are modern-day stents. The, the, the long, skinny one is the, the stent uh, before we inflate it, and then the, the short squat one is the, the stent now being inflated into the coronary artery. So you, you come in, we do the heart catheterization through the, through the one-way valve, advance the catheter, we uh, engage where the, the plaque is, we blow up 
the balloon, deflate the balloon, and then pull the catheter back out. So placement of stent in the setting of a STEMI is standard of care today. We know that it, this saves lives, increases longevity, and improves quality of life. The evolution of balloon angioplasties to modern day stents technology is a, a fascinating journey. At one time, believe it or not, to try to, to prevent the, the clot from forming in, in the stent, we actually had a, a radiologist, uh, a, a radiology oncologist in the catheterization lab at the time, and they were zapping the stent with, with radiation while, while the stent was being placed. I mean, it's come a long way since that time, and it's, again, it's, it's a fascinating story. The newest generation of stents are easier to deliver and cause much less injury. There is a balance, however. You're buying bleeding risks by inhibiting the risk of stent thrombosis. So after a stent, you have to take platelet-inhibiting medications for at least a year. These medications are more commonly called Plavix or Bolenta are the two most common. Thrent stent thrombosis is the worst, and you simply don't want it. So this is a quote from my, my friend, Dr. Al Assad. If you're going to a, an island and you can only bring one thing, you must, all that matters is if you bring your Plavix. You've got to take your Plavix every day. Dr. Al Assad is our interventional uh, cardiologist here at ACMC. Um, he does heart catheterizations every day, but here at the hospital, we do not do uh, coronary interventions. He, um, he does his coronary interventions over at Hillcrest on uh, Wednesday mornings and Friday afternoons. So the, the treatment of stable angina. So the treatment of stable angina is probably the most controversial thing that we deal with on a daily basis. It's probably one of the most controversial things that we do and probably the least understood that we do in, in cardiology. There's no one-size-fits-all approach here. So stable angina is a, a, a person that shows up in your office that occasionally develops chest heaviness. Um, with, with m at least moderate to uh, severe exertion. Um, he's a, a person that does not have signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure, um, and he, he's very stable. So it's more of a, it, it's more of a, a quality of life sh issue more than anything else. So stable angina is a quality of life issue and generally can be successfully treated with medications. It has no, stable angina has no impact on how long the person is going to live versus putting a stent or brushing them off to coronary bypass surgery. These folks have very stable exams, no issues with heart failure, no reduction in functional capacity. So when to consider placing a stent in a, sta a stable angina patient? We learned, uh, we've learned through several very large studies that placing a stent in a patient with stable angina offers no longevity benefit. The biggest risk in, in placing a stent with somebody with stable angina is making a, a stable lesion unstable and then having to take powerful blood thinners afterwards. Again, the benefits of placing a stent in a stable patient are really symptomatic relief. I think the common mistake of the general public, again, is sometimes they look and they look at having 
blockage as being like a cancer and people just think I, I just want this out and they think that placing a stent is a way of getting it out and it, and it really isn't and again what I'm trying to demonstrate to you today is having a 40 percent lesion is just as dangerous as having a 70 percent lesion so when to consider when to consider placing a stent in a stable patient. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle addressing agent. So again, you sit down and you counsel the patient. Um, and if the patient is, is, is able to do the things that they're able, wanting to do in, in general life, then you just leave that person alone and you continue the medication. But if the patient comes in and says, hey, look, doc, these medications are just making me sick. Or they come in and say, hey, look, I can't work in my garden anymore. Or I can't climb the flight of stairs. Or I can't have sex with my wife. These are, these are things, that are, these are lifestyle issues. And, and again, these, then, then you start talking to them about maybe placing the stent. So again, our, our approach to treating stable angina, again, is, is sitting down and talking to the patient. Uh, again, addressing a physical exam, make sure they don't have any signs or symptoms of congestive heart failure. And then for me, my big thing is I like to put a lot of these patients on, uh, do a, a, a stress test. I like to put a lot of these people on a, a treadmill because when you start developing uh, chest pain, if you, uh, whether you develop the chest pain earlier in the stress test or later in the stress test, whether you develop EKG changes earlier in the stress test or later in the stress test, is, is very determinant of what they, they're able to do in the general public. The other thing that we, we often use is nuclear imaging. So we use the nuclear imaging because we found that um, by doing the nuclear imaging, if there's a large area of, of heart that uh, is being jeopardized by having this blockage, then we will consider uh, putting a stent in at that time. So I like to pivot. I spent a lot of time on coronary artery disease. Hope I didn't bore you guys. Uh, I want to talk about something that's very prevalent in Ashtabule, something called atrial fibrillation. I'm sure that everybody knows somebody or m you might be affected by atrial fibrillation yourself. So what is atrial fibrillation? <laughs> so what is atrial fibrillation? A uh, atrial fibrillation is for some reason, and we don't really know why, the heart develops abnormal impulses. So the illustration over, over there is the heart generally has one impulse, and the impulse is generally located in, in the right atrium. It goes down to the left atrium, back down the ventricles, then back up, and that's the normal impulse of the heart. For some reason, people with atrial fibrillation develop uh, abnormal impulses. 75% of these all impulses are actually uh, located outside the heart in the pulmonary veins. What atrial fibrillation is, is you get all these uh, abnormal impulses firing at one time. And so the heart typically works in what we call a syncytium, so that the top chambers work and then the bottom chambers work. And you have this nice rhythmic contraction, right? With atrial fibrillation, the, the Top of the, chamber, the top chambers of the heart work independently of the bottom chambers, so you get this quivering motion, right? So you don't get this complete emptying. So this causes problems in the fact that the heart's usually working at, as, a, as a unit, and now it's not working as a unit anymore, so you lose somewhere between 25 to 30 percent of the efficiency of the heart. And so a lot of people complain of fatigue because the heart's not working efficiently. The other problem with this is that because the, you're not contracting all the way. The blood, because you're just quivering, this blood is not completely entering, and so the blood can pool in there and form a clot. That clot can drop down into the ventricle, and that clot can go someplace where you don't like, where you, where you don't want it to go, like the brain, causing a mass, a massive stroke. Strokes due to atrial fibrillation are usually pretty severe. So some of the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. So some people, believe it or not, don't have any symptoms. But most people c are, come in and they complain of this irregularity in, in, a, in their chest. They feel this rapid beating, the palpitations. A lot of 
complaints of weakness and fatigue, shortness of breath, dizziness or lightheadedness, or swelling, or sometimes they just overall just don't feel well. Some common causes of atrial fibrillation, and, and these are in, in no particular order. Um, some common causes are it's due to uh, uh, something that you're, you're born with, what we call con uh, congenital heart defect. Uh, age ha is very prominent uh, in the fact that the, the atrial node becomes a little bit old than the pacer, and they develop something called sick sinus syndrome. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation in people over the age of 80 is somewhere between 30 and 35 percent, so we see it quite often. Um, unfortunately, uh, another common cause is obstructive sleep apnea, having a heart attack, uh, heart valve disease, high blood pressure, uh, lung diseases. So we see this quite often this time of the year. Uh, with people developing pneumonia, then the pneumonia causes stress on the heart, causing the heart to go out of rhythm. Uh, COVID uh, viral infections was a big seller uh, during the pandemic. We had a lot more incidents of uh, atrial fibrillation. Coronary artery disease is a, is a common cause. Thyroid disorders, uh, either a, a overactive or underactive thyroid, uh, obesity. Typically, the younger person that comes in uh, in their 50s or 60s is typically a male, typically obese, typically high blood pressure with obstructive sleep apnea. That's usually the type of patients that we see that before the age of 80. Heart surgery is very common for causing atrial fibrillation, but that's different than the atrial fibrillation that people develop in the community. About 30 to 35 percent of people that have open heart surgery develop atrial fibrillation. But usually that's not treated the same way as, again, the atrial fibrillation that we see in the community. Treatment of atrial fibrillation. So the way I describe atrial fibrillation, if we were McDonald's, atrial fibrillation would be our Big Mac. It's our number one cell in cardiology. So the treatment of atrial fibrillation is threefold. So we know that people get sick if their heart either goes too slow or too fast. And so we, we want to try to get them in a groove where they're not going too fast or too slow. The next thing that we try to do, if at all possible, is try to, to uh, restore normal, normal sinus rhythm. And then lastly, and probably the most, uh, the most important thing, um, is, is we, we want to uh, prevent people from having a stroke. That, that's number one. The way that you, look, you need to look at atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation is more of a nuisance more than anything else. It typically doesn't kill people, it's, but it does make people sick. So I, I wanted to bring up uh, Dr. Kanj. Uh, Dr. Kanj is an electrophysiologist that comes to us uh, once a month, typically the second Tuesday of the month. Dr. Kanj is what we call electrophysiologist. So he, he is a um, cardiologist that specializes in the electro, electrical uh, properties of the heart. Dr. Kanj um, is, probably has done more watchmans than anybody else in, in the country. A watchman procedure is a technique um, to prevent um, strokes due to atrial fibrillation. The other thing I wanted to mention is so people hear of people having ablations due to atrial fibrillation. And it was very common for people to go in for an ablation and, and the procedure taking somewhere between four and eight hours long. Well, there's a new technique for uh, uh, restoration uh, of sinus rhythm with atrial fibrillation. Uh, uh, a, and they revise this technique, the, the ablation, and the procedure is uh, less than an hour now. So by uh, making it a little safer, uh, still as effective as the old way, uh, ablations for atrial fibrillation is now becoming a more of uh, a first-line uh, therapy for the treatment of atrial fibrillation. I'm sorry this slide didn't come out very well, but I, I did, uh, did want to finish on this note because this is becoming more and more uh, common uh, we, we get consults now uh, for people that come in 
that or are obese with progressive shortness of breath. And I wanted to let you, I wanted to bring this up because, again, because it is becoming more common, but I do want to, you know, people know me and they, they come to see me and they know that I focus in on weight, but it's their weight that actually is probably one of the biggest things that contributes to their heart health. So one of the common things that we see with this kind of phenotype is, is something called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. What does that mean? It means that they come in with symptoms of heart failure, although their ejection fraction is normal. What's ejection fraction? Ejection fraction is, so we measure ejection fraction by something called the echocardiogram. So we look at the amount of blood that goes into your heart versus the amount of blood that gets squeezed out of your heart. A normal ejection fraction is somewhere between uh, uh, 55 and 65 percent. So these people come in with perfectly normal ejection fractions. The typical person that comes in typically has a body type like this, so they have a lot of uh, visceral adiposity. This visceral adiposity affects the heart in the fact that what it does is actually cause a pericardial fat pad. So your heart your heart sits in a purse, and in that purse there's a little bit of fluid, so it allows the heart to be very mobile. But, so what happens is this visceral fat actually causes a, a, a fat pad a, around that purse, that pericardium, and it doesn't allow the heart to be as mobile. The other problem with this kind of phenotype is it increases blood volume. By increasing blood volume, if uh, by increasing blood volume, you increase your blood pressure. The other, the other problem with this is it surrounds your organs. And so by surrounding your organs, your, your pancreas is not going to be working as, as effectively, and neither is, is your liver. So you develop something called steatosis or fatty liver disease. And so when you look at their, uh, when you look at their marker of uh, uh, liver enzymes, like their ALT, the, the ALT is going to be elevated. So you also get something else that raises blood pressure. You get nitric oxide coupling. So by having this phenotype, it doesn't allow nitric oxide to, to work as effectively. Nitric oxide is like the secret sauce of Viagra. But nitric oxide, predict, uh, nitric oxide controls our blood pressure. So nit nitric oxide makes our arteries more pliable, and the more pliable our artery is, the healthier you're going to be. It, it also produces inflammatory cytokines, and so this combination of, of developing the fat pad and inflammatory cytokines, what these uh, abnormal cells do is they penetrate uh, the, the lumen of the heart, and by doing so, makes the heart more stiff. And so this, therefore, the, the patient becomes a, a little sicker. So the heart needs to act like a rubber band. So as the blood enters into the heart, it needs, to, it needs to receive the blood, expand, and then whatever the blood pressure is, it's going to contract. The problem with this condition is um, the heart becomes a little stiffer, and so as the blood enters in, it's a little bit more resistant. And the problem is, is when you start to go to walk or start to do something, a certain amount of blood ends up backflowing up into the lungs, causing shortness of breath. So how do we treat this? The first, we treat this uh, in a number of ways. We give medications, either ACE or ARBs, to make the heart a little bit more pliable. One of, uh, we, uh, uh, blood pressure control. Sometimes we use beta blockers to slow the heart down a little bit, so it gives it a little bit more time to fill. But under, but you also have to address the underlying cause of this, right? And so, one of the common medications that we're using right now are uh, the GLP agonists. So we're, there's been several studies in this group using Ozempic, and. Uh, how many people here are using Ozempic or any of the drugs like that? They're very powerful drugs. And as, as far as cardiovascular risk reduction, somewhere between 20 and 30%. And so a couple years ago, 
you know, we get this all the time. It's like, why does a cardiologist care about my blood sugar? Well, one is because when we use these drugs, we can, we can reduce your risk of having strokes and heart attacks by 20 or 30 percent. The other reason why we look at these kind of drugs is because we, we treat these kind of disorders. Yeah, so next slide. Yeah. Yeah. When I was asked to give this talk, I was given my choice of dates. Since the, to since the talk was about heart disease, I picked the 28th. The reason I picked this day was because my dad passed away 11 years today. And he died of ha uh, heart failure. <clears throat> In retrospect, I would not be here today if it wasn't for him. He was a patient of Dr. John Stevens, and it was, it was through Dr. Stevens that I learned of my current position. The practice of cardiology has come a long way in my 40 plus years, and is as ever evolving. Unfortunately, our patients are becoming younger and sicker and adding to the challenge. It's through efforts like this one that we help to try to educate our public and change the trajectory of others' lives. Thank you for your time. Of course. I just wondered, because um, I noticed something about eggs, and I love eggs, mm -hmm. and that was a no-no before, but they don't really affect your cholesterol anymore that much? Or are you so, um, this is very common, and this is a very common question, okay? So, again, most of the cholesterol that we, we take in by mouth does not get absorbed. You have something, you have like little... Uh, you have like little guardings over there. It's called the neiman pixie axis. And so the neiman pixie axis regulates our cholesterol in our blood. And it's only going to absorb the cholesterol that we actually need. Okay? And other than that, uh, it doesn't get absorbed. And in fact, in 2015, American Heart Association deemed that cholesterol was no longer a, a nutrient of concern. Now, saturated fat is different now, okay? Saturated fat, okay, that you get from like red meats and, and other kind of things, that will raise your cholesterol, okay? So totally different, okay? So when you look at an egg, high in cholesterol, low in saturated fat, good, right? Same thing with shellfish, high in cholesterol, low in saturated fat, totally different than eating a steak, high in saturated fat, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, in the event of sleep apnea that you said plays a big part in arterial fibrillation, mm -hmm. and if you can't use a CPAP, are there any other alternatives to combating that sleep apnea? Yeah, and it can, depends on your severity of sleep apnea, right? And so what people get confused about sleep apnea is people think sleep apnea is absence of sleep, and it's not. It's the absence of proper breathing while you're sleeping. It's totally different. So the purpose of a breath is to provide oxygen to blow off carbon dioxide. And so people with sleep apnea, their oxygen levels go very low, carbon dioxide level goes very high. So <clears throat> what happens is with that, it puts the body in a state of panic. And so norepinephrine levels go really high, serum cortisol levels go very high. So it's, you know, these people wake up and they never feel fully rested. They feel like they got chased by a tiger all night long. So how do you treat sleep apnea? So again, it, it's really individualized. There's, there's, really, there's really three flavors of sleep apnea. There's obstructive, so either your tongue is rolling back or the airway, your larynx is partially closed and causing an obstruction, okay? And that's probably the most common. But there's also one that's more severe and it's called central sleep apnea. And for some reason, your brain doesn't send signals to your respiratory muscles and you, you quit breathing at night. And these are the kind of people that die in the middle of their night. And this is very severe. And that one, you have to wear a mask and you should wear a mask. The obstructive sleep apnea can be very simple. So <coughs> there, there's a new device called the Inspire device. So it's a little implantable thing that helps keep your airway open during the night. You just sort of click on, you see the commercials all the time. There's mouthpieces so your tongue doesn't roll back. And then uh, 
um, I, I advocate to my patients to uh, consider taping their mouth shut. No, I'm very serious in the fact that since, uh, in the last couple of years, there's actually been two books published on, on the benefits of, of, of nose breathing. So when you, when you breathe through your mouth, you don't produce as much nitro, nitric oxide. The first, first step of nitric oxide production is done in your mouth. So mouth breathers typically have high blood pressure. So it's one way of controlling your blood pressure is, is breathing through your nose. The other thing that nose breathing does is by taping your mouth shut, you sort of lock your tongue in a place, right? So your tongue has no place to go. The other thing is when you're breathing through your nose, you increase the partial pressure of oxygen. And so by doing so, your larynx is less apt to, to close. And again, I'm not saying it's a, a, a cure for obstructive sleep apnea, but I got so many patients that have obstructive sleep apnea that can't tolerate being on CPAP, and so this is one viable option. But if they can't make it through the night because of their, type, their mouth is shut, then they, they need to consider uh, some other kind of form of uh, treatment. Question. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, my family has bad history of heart disease, mm -hmm. so what can I do? <laughs> well, the first thing that you need to do is to modify your risk factors, right? But then one of the tests that you really need to get done is, uh, so you need to get tested for LP little a. So LP little a, a lot of people don't know about it, but it, it's a form of cholesterol that's very common in people that have a, a pattern of heart disease in their family. And you, it's a little bit late for you, but you're, you're, you, want, you, you want your kids to have this test because then if, they, if we know that they have elevated LP little a at an early age, then we're going to start cracking down on their risk factors as soon as possible. For you to prevent cardiovascular disease, well, uh, you know, things that we talked about. What's your cholesterol? What's your blood pressure? What's your blood sugar? If we get those things under control, then again, we're going to be able to kick that can farther on down the road. I also have a family with uh, high cholesterol. My mm -hmm. brother has really bad cholesterol. I was given cholesterol, and within the last five years, I was told to, instead of one per, one per day, it's one every other day. Uh -huh. So I understand. If I understand right, my cholesterol level has come down to bad cholesterol. So you want to look at what your LDL cholesterol is, right? And then, you know, with, with your risk, you should be looking at an LDL cholesterol less than 70. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so having a, a symptom of AFib and being shot back into rhythm, Mm -hmm. Has that damaged your heart at all by being shot? No, not at all. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you.